Hello, thanks for joining me. In this video I'm going to show you round two Cardiganshire churches by the same architect, separated by only 10 miles and opened within seven years of each other. The difference between them is huge. One was done in a tremendous hurry on a shoestring, the other with a substantial budget and more time. This is the first church, St Tidville's at Leckrid near Cardigan. There was an old church here, but it was prone to flooding from the River Tyvee. It now lies abandoned, so a new church was proposed on higher land given by Mr Lascelles of Pencraig Mansion in Cleckrid. However, there was an argument about that. He would not give title of the land to the church commissioners until the contract to build was signed and they wouldn't go ahead with the contract until the conveyancing was completed. Stalemate in the end, it was resolved on the agreement that the church was built within two years from his offer of the land. It was just. It must have been built very quickly as so much time was wasted by the lawyers. The architect chosen to build it was John Middleton of Cheltenham. And if you've seen my video on Kenarth Church, you will know that I am not his greatest admirer. It's on a very small site. Mr Lascelles just cut off a corner of one of his meadows and it had no burial ground. Middleton filled most of the available site with the footprint of the church and made it tall and wide to compensate for the lack of length afforded by the awkward plot. It has a simple plan with nave, chancel, vestry and timber porch and a bell cot. It's not easily visible except from the road so a plain exterior makes sense and he only had £600 to spend. Time to go inside. I'll warn you now, it's not going to be pretty. Middleton lined the church in different coloured brick. Subsequently, someone thought it might look even better if they painted it. I'm really not sure that was a good idea. Structural polychromy, to give the proper name for using different coloured bricks here, was old hat by 1878 when this church opened but it had the advantage of being both decorative and capable of being executed cheaply, so Middleton used it anyway. William Butterfield was the architect who got it going, and that was in the 1850s, influenced by John Ruskin. Middleton wasn't attempting anything too fancy here, mostly stock brick, with some leafy bricks at the top, possibly terracotta, and some of those green glazed bricks which are unfortunately more usually seen in public conveniences of the period. Now the original scheme is lost under a peeling coat of paint in an off-white with a dado under a thin black stripe and bits and pieces highlighted in paint which reminds me of peach flavoured angel delight. It's a mess. It wasn't just the walls that got the treatment either. The pulpit steps and font are all coated in it. The only paint John Middleton intended was the wording round the chancel arch, which thankfully escaped being obliterated by the peach and cream scheme. He fitted the church out with pitch pine benches, pulpit and chancel fittings, which are not as plain or shoddy as they might have been with the little money available, and though nothing special are quite correct Victorian Gothic. I suspect that it came mostly from church furniture catalogues rather than Middleton spending time designing it himself. There are some nice metalwork touches such as the pulpit step handrail and the lectern which was given in 1899 in memory of Maria Brigstock, herself a generous donor to local churches. There was not much stained glass until this window was installed in the 1950s, depicting a figure representing Hope with her symbolic anchor, very appropriately, as it was given in memory of the daughter of Admiral Hope of Glanhelic House. Middleton had an unfortunate tendency towards heaviness and too much florid detail, which he avoided here because of the constraints put on him. If it were not for the later paint, it would be a decent little country church. Next to St Cunflo's Langunflo, where Middleton could take his time and do something better. There was already a church here, it was from the 1820s, but this was the church serving the Bronwyth estate, where Gothic was the thing, and once the Georgian house of Sir Thomas Lloyd had been Gothicised, the church was going to have the same treatment. 
R.K. Penson did a great job on the house, but Middleton got the contract for rebuilding the church. This is what he did with the money in 1870. Lavish, isn't it? He had £1,000 to spend on this one. The budget overran a little bit. Well, more than that. It actually cost over twice the original amount. At the time, Sir Thomas Lloyd was heavily in debt as well, so a fundraising campaign was launched and the Tyler family of Mount Gurnos, the other estate in the parish, generously contributed. Middleton also got the job of rebuilding their house, which he did much to its detriment. It has since been demolished. In the Nocutionese to chancel, there's ashlar masonry with polychromatic banding, a profusion of carved angels and a lovely painted roof. Middleton pulled out all the stops here and achieved the desired effect. The carving was done by Bolton of Cheltenham and it's good quality. Interestingly, the angels hold scrolls in both English and Welsh. The dado in the sanctuary has wheat ears and vine leaves to symbolise the bread and wine of the Eucharist. This church was, and still is, at the higher end of Anglicanism and the altar is where you look first when you arrive. There's a Piscina, a credence table and Sedalia cut out of the window base, which unusually has a bunch of leeks underneath. The very busy Rerodos was paid for by the Tyler family. They were high church. The cross in the centre was a present from Mr Middleton. The stalls and reading desk, though pitch pine, have good details, probably from the Ecclesiastical Fitters catalogue's mid-range offerings, I suspect. I don't think Middleton ever went to the trouble of designing such things himself. The tiling is typical of Middleton, though, not quite right for a make-believe medieval floor. There are tiles more fitting for a butcher's shop or fireplace in there with the mint and gothic ones. He really didn't get tiles. Unlike the best Victorian ecclesiastical architects who'd studied real medieval buildings, the vestry became an organ chamber when the organ was acquired in 1893. A later organist was Miss Nesta Lloyd, daughter of Sir Martin Lloyd of Bronwith and granddaughter of Sir Thomas Lloyd. Its arrival meant a new vestry had to be tacked onto the side of the tower. Middleton cut his professional teeth on railway contracts and his tendency to overscale everything may be a legacy of that. This chancel arch, for example, which looked as if it were designed to be viewed from a longer distance than is possible here. I didn't like those short marble shafts with florid capitals in Kenarth Church. Here, in a smaller church, he made them even bigger, and I like them even less. They have that sooty whiff of railway station about them that the angels can't quite erase. The roof corbels also look as though they were designed to support something more substantial than the timbers that rest on them. The carving is chunky and each is different with lots of different plants and a Welsh harp, more domestic than churchy. The pulpit and font are heavy with florid decoration too. The font was a gift from the Tyler family on the baptism of their daughter Daisy in 1869 probably its first use as the church wasn't altogether finished then. Here we have Christian symbolism, if you overlook the water lilies on the hefty floral capital. They'd never float, would they? The baptism of Christ is shown along with Suffer the little children to come unto me and symbols of the four evangelists. St Paul preaches to eager listeners on the pulpit a subtle hint to the congregation should their eyes stray from the preacher during the sermon. St Peter and St John are on the corners. It was given by Sir Thomas Lloyd in memory of his youngest brother. In the nave and porch, the polychromy is done in stone and brick, happily paint-free as it's well done. The effect is dampened by the generous covering of war monuments, mostly to previous generations of Lloyds, and being classical, they're a bit incongruous, though the one to Sir Thomas Lloyd's parents is Gothic. Another Gothic memorial looks like a statue of the Virgin Mary at first sight. That would be too Catholic, though. It was put here in memory of Sir Thomas Lloyd's wife, Lady Henrietta Mary, 
and depicts Ruth with the biblical quotation, Thy people shall be my people. Appropriate as Lady Lloyd actively got involved in local life, though she was a stranger here. She was not only English, but had a French mother, the Comtesse de Lorme. Sir Thomas Lloyd's memorial is the east window, and his grandson is remembered in the west window. Tragically, and fatally for the future of the Lloyds of Bronwith, young Martin Camais Arundel Lloyd was killed in the First World War. This window depicts St George and St Martin on either side of a medieval knight, being presented with the martyr's crown or crown of life by an angel with peacock feather wings. The Lloyds have their burial vault outside. When I visited it had a single red poppy blooming on it. Nature's memorial to the lost heir of Bronwith. The churchyard, like the church, is beautifully maintained with wild flowers and a stunning view over the site of Bronwith Mansion, sadly now erased from the landscape. Middleton reused part of the original tower, the only thing he didn't demolish from the original church, and capped it with a splayfoot spire which only emphasises its stubbiness. This is a tower and porch in one, and the inner door is flanked with carved heads of a bishop and, well, not the usual monarch, but this soldier come bishop. He's probably intended to be St Martin of Tours, who was both soldier and bishop, though not at the same time. Sir Thomas Lloyd claimed descent from another Martin of Tours who came to Britain in the Norman Conquest and became Marcher Lloyd of Camais, Pembrokeshire. Sir Thomas Lloyd had a mania for genealogy. He claimed descent from Welsh princes and Norman knights and wanted the title of Marcher Lloyd and associated baronetcy for himself and spent lavishly in pursuit of his claim. Ironically, it contributed to the downfall of the family's prestige as the money spent on lawyers and the time spent petitioning the government would have been better spent on keeping his estate together. The tower is the most interesting and unusual feature of the exterior, which is otherwise not as exciting as the interior, but also has a lighter feel. The windows have good and varied tracery. The stops have a variety of carved heads, and there's a row of chunky leaf decoration to delineate the chancel. The Pevsner Buildings of Wales book for Carmarthenshire and Ceredigion describes this as the best example in south-west Wales of a high Victorian estate church with exceptional polychrome interior and carved work, and it's grade two star listed. I do like it, but not entirely as you probably gathered. If we're going to compare estate churches of the area, my vote goes to Slamvay and Aunt Gwyn, done on far less money but with originality and elegance. See this video, card in the corner, for that one if you've not seen it or want to refresh your memory. Which one do you prefer? Let me know in the comments. Thank you to the obliging church warden who let me in to film and photograph the church he cares for so well. And as always... Thank you for watching.